everyone. Russell Aquarimax here. Excuse me while I get my microphone set up here. I want to make sure you can hear me well. There we go. Hopefully that is uh, working for you. Just wanted to uh, let you know I do have a guest today. I've got Pago, our leopard gecko, with us today. She's going to be joining us for just a few minutes, I think, as we get started. So here she is. She's become quite a bit more active since uh, the weather has started to change and it's it's warmer. She, of course, always has her hot spot, but uh, she seems to like the warmer weather anyway. Robert Gear, hello, and Gordes Gecko, indeed. Here she is. Hopefully I can keep her in focus. I'm trying to. But yeah, she's been really active and it's been fun to uh, see her doing that. We did some remodeling in her vivarium recently and I think she's um, kind of responded well to that. Gordia says, small lizard bean. <laughs> I like it. It's cool. Well, welcome everyone. Let's see, i make sure that I get uh, everybody in there. Oh, I want to make sure I'm doing the, the live chat too. Okay, good. Now, all messages should be visible. I want to make sure I get that. Um, it's a little strange for me this time because I have the camera on the right side rather than left. So if I if I look like I'm doing weird things, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll try to get used to looking at the camera right there instead of over there. So I wanted to uh, tell everyone that my wife Kelly and I got to have uh, a little getaway and we got to do some herping during that time. And so, well, we got to view a lot of wildlife, but uh, a predominant um, focus, I guess, on our, our little excursions during our trip to see wildlife were focused on reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates, just like the channel. And I will be releasing a video about that. I'm not going to give a lot of detail right now because I don't want to spoil the fun of the video, but I'll just say we had a successful trip. We got to see some things we had never seen before. So that was fun. At least not seen in the wild before. So very, very fun trip. Gordia says, I recently caught a ferocious water bug and I finally got it to eat. Cool. Those are pretty amazing. Is it like the giant water bug? The ones that get, you know, two and a half inches long and uh, have the raptorial front legs almost like a mantis? Those are pretty amazing. I've caught a couple of those myself. Um, I found one about a year ago just at the bus stop. I was waiting for the bus and randomly it was there. There's not even a body of water nearby. So that was funny. Okay, so you got a different species, but it's a little bit smaller. All right, yeah, they're all amazing. Uh, I was even bitten by one, one point when I was camping. The first one I ever found when I was a, I was a, probably about 13 years old and found one. wasn't exactly sure what it was at the time. I think I had read about giant water bugs, but didn't realize that it could bite me. So I picked it up and it bit me on the finger, and that stung quite a bit and lasted a while. They're not. Uh, not extremely gentle when you are not gentle with them, I guess. I was trying to be, but anyway. Robert Gear said, so what would you say is a healthy weight for an adult leopard gecko? Well, I would say it depends on whether it's male or female. It depends on the morph, too. But, hmm. I mean, males tend, tend to get a bit more massive, and then you, have, of course, have giant leopard geckos and strains with some... or individuals with some giant genes that have um, a larger size, so it's going to be hard to say. And honestly, right now, numbers aren't occurring to me, but I will tell you a couple things that you can think about when you're thinking about a healthy leopard gecko. If you are getting big bulges right back here behind their uh, arms, big bulges back there, then you'd say it's probably overweight. Um, a lot of people get those because they're overfeeding their gecko. Um, this little lady, you know, they should be kind of plump, and, and the females especially kind of get plump, and their tail should be somewhat plump, you know, like this. But you don't want them to see, um, you don't want them to have the, the buildup of fat back behind here. That's indicative of um, an overweight gecko. And if you notice the tail being too thin, of course, that would be a problem too. Um, so I know that's not very great numerically, but hopefully that's, you know, kind of a basic guideline. And here we come. Let's see. 
the animal kingdom number one. I lived in Las Vegas and I found a little millipede when I was taking a walk. It was on the sidewalk near wet grass and rocks. Cool. I wonder what species it is. So, um, Robert, let me know if that helps a little. I know it's not a good number. I don't have a number in my head right now, but um, if that gives you an idea of just general appearance and how they should be looking um, based on, on that, if that helps a little bit. Let's see. Zero cool ninja. What's up? You're here. And Varenid guy. Hey, Russ, made it. Thank you. Glad you're here. And uh, I was excited to see your uh, video of your mug arriving. And that's going to be coming out on this channel since it's an Aquarimax mug. So everybody will be watching for that. The Animal Kingdom once has never seen one since I've lived here, which is a while. Yeah, millipedes. Uh, there are a few millipedes you can find in desert areas. I wonder if yours is one of the Orthoporus or Nautis or other Orthoporus species. Um, that would be kind of cool. They can get pretty big. Um, let's see. So Gordius says the exact species of his giant water bug, who is Abetus herberti. Oh, okay, cool. They're all, that the whole group is really interesting. And Verena guy said, oh, that mug is so awesome. I love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You deserve it. You won the contest. So, Mark Osborne, hi, welcome. Good to see you. And uh, I've got a video in the works for you. And you probably know what it's about. So it is coming. Been doing some, some work on that. Leopard Gecko 05, do dart frogs need a pool or waterfall? Hmm, good question, a little controversy here, but I'm going to say what I have learned over time. A lot of people put a pool or waterfall in with dart frogs. Looks cool, especially when it's like a waterfall type pool and you have, you know, the running water with the plants cascading down, mosses and things like that growing on a waterfall or whatever. Can look really cool. The big problem is that, uh, well, there are a couple of big problems that can occur. One is that you can get leakage from the pond. One is that you can get the, the pump is easy to clog in such an environment. And another one is that if you just have still water without a pump or anything like that, you can get a lot of bacterial growth really quickly and it can be a danger to the frogs. So the short answer is no, you don't need a pool or waterfall with dart frogs. I don't have one with mine. I have at, on occasion in the past had pools and they will sit in them. They'll enjoy it, but keeping it clean can be tricky. And if you just keep um, high humidity levels in the vivarium and you mist the vivarium regularly, they will get enough water. Of course, if you're going to breed them, that's something else. They do need a small body of water. A lot of people use a Petri dish covered by a cocoa hut or bromeliads that naturally pool water inside them can work too. But yeah, they, they need it for breeding. They don't need it just to live. So. They can, they can do fine for years without a, a water dish. Good question. And Robert Gear says, based on your description, I'd say my Leo might be slightly overweight. So is he getting the little um, buildup of fat back there? Okay, so someone wanted Desolate World just got here and I'm already so confused. Oh, why? What are you confused about? What can I help with? Did I say something confusing? <laughs> Let's find out. Oh, thanks to those who are hitting the like button already. Appreciate that. Leopard Gecko 5 says, what is the best type of fruit flies for bumblebee dart frogs? Okay. Well, I give mine both Melanogaster completely wingless, and I also give them Heidi Eye, um, just flightless Heidi Eye, normal flightless Heidi Eye. I don't think there are any other type of Heidi Eye. They all have wings uh, for the the types that are available in the hobby, you can have golden ones and you can have different colors, but I think they're all winged. I give them both uh, and they work great. They're very capable of eating both. You don't have to have both for them, so that's up to you. Um, you can also give them other insects, of course, but I give them both Melanogaster and Heidi Eye. And so Robert Gear says, yeah, his leopard gecko does have a little bit of that fat back there. If it's just a little bit, I wouldn't worry too much. A lot of leopard geckos are mildly overweight in captivity and it's not really a big deal. But uh, if it gets, you know, you see those swellings a lot, then you probably want to tone it down a little bit on the feeding. Zerkulu Ninja 88, have you ever kept any dart frogs? Maybe one thumbnail dart frog in an 8x8x12. Eight by eight by um, I have never kept dart frogs in an 8x8x12. Eight by eight by I would say 
Hmm. Most, most froggers I know keep them in larger things, at least when they're big. I mean, when they're little, you might do that. But um, uh, as adults, you, you might want a slightly bigger one, like the, the 12 by 12 by 18 high. Uh, it might be better. Um, rented guy, how is the fish tank with CO2 coming along? Um, it's coming along pretty well. The plants, the, the, I can never say the name, Pogestemon stellatus octopus, it's producing a lot of roots. It seems to be doing pretty well. And uh, I'm excited about that. Um, the other plant, uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, we'll see how that's going to do. But yeah, I think the, the octopus is growing pretty well. The... Um, the guppy grass is, is doing fairly well also, and algae has definitely decreased in the tank. I'm still trying to dial in exactly. I'm going to have to go ahead and put a, a drop checker in because I feel like I'm having a hard time monitoring how much CO2 is going in. Um, that's, yeah, it's a, but it, it is, it is definitely making a difference. I'm, I've been using a diffuser kind of temporarily because I wanted to be able to monitor the CO2 flow, but now that I think I'm dialing that in and getting a handle on it, I would say uh, it's probably going to be better to route it through the impeller, which is what I've done in the past. I think, though, part of what I want to do is change out the filter. It's got a bio-wheel filter in there, but of course I took out the bio-wheel because that's going to drive off too much CO2 as it splashes around and you know carries the water over the wheel. That would drive far too much of the CO2 away, so I took that out right away as I hooked up the CO2. But I think um, the way it, the weir is built, the water drops too far and then kind of splashes too much. And I think that's driving away some of the CO2 as well. I think I am getting, you know, an appreciable amount and the plants are reacting to it, but I think I could get a little bit more. And I think if I were to put in, say, an aqua clear or something with a different type of flow so the water's not getting agitated as much at the surface, I think I would probably get a little more. So I think I'm probably going to do that eventually. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So someone where Desolate Worlds had just got here in the middle of a conversation. So that's why you were, you were confused. Leopard Gecko 5 says, do you breed fruit flies? And if so, um, how do you breed them? Okay. Fruit flies are pretty easy to breed. I do have a video on that. If you do a video for Fruit Flies Aquarimax, um, it'll give you the whole lowdown on how to do that. Um, fairly popular video. But I will tell you the, the short answer, uh, breeding fruit flies. Yeah, if you're going to keep something that eats fruit flies, it's best to breed them. They're just, they cost a lot to just keep buying, but they're really cheap to breed if you, you know, set it up right. And... They're really pretty easy to breed. Basically, you get a medium. You can buy medium, like Rapashi produces a medium. Josh's Frogs produces a medium. There are lots of other companies that produce fruit fly medium that you can just buy commercially and mix with water, essentially. Really easy. I tend to mix my own media. I have one of the recipes that I've used on the, the video that I mentioned. Uh, but the, the base is potato flakes, and then I use um, nutritional yeast and some other ingredients like spirulina and things like that in the, the recipe. It works really well. Um, you basically mix the, the medium with water until it's kind of a mashed potato-y sort of consistency, maybe a little moister than that. And then put in some Excelsior in the container and then put the cover on after you put the flies in and it's cooled enough. And that culture, like that, once you got the flies in there, is usually, it will start producing in approximately two weeks depending on temperature, a little slower, faster and also the species of fly because Hydei fruit flies breed a little more slowly than Melanogaster, then you'll get a ton of flies and you'll need to harvest regularly from that container. If you don't, it'll get overcrowded and you have about a month during which the colony will produce really well and then it will start to peter out and you have to worry about mites and things like that. So what I usually do is maybe three to five days, three to seven days, somewhere in there, after the culture starts producing flies, I start another culture. So I've always got several cultures going and that way you'll have an endless supply of flies and probably more than you need unless you have a lot of creatures that eat them. Luckily I have frogs, geckos, chickens, fish, and so on that will eat them, so that helps. And not just those, I have others that will eat them too. So hopefully that helps and check out my video, just search, do a Google search for Aquarimax, fruit fly, something like that, and you'll get it for more specific things. Okay, so 
Robert Gere says, I'm interested in purchasing a beetle. Any input? Ah, okay. Well, although I have kept a few beetles, I don't have extensive experience, but I'll, I will tell you that um, one of the ones that's most interesting to me uh, that I would probably get um, if I were to get a beetle soon uh, is a, one of the desert darkling beetles or a death thinning beetle. Those are really hardy. They're easy to keep in fairly small containers. They're active. They eat almost anything. They'll eat both um, most organic matter like fruit, um, meat, protein based things. You know, people use them as a cleanup crew insects for their um, for their uh, scorpions and things like that. So they're very hardy. They can live quite a long time. So death feigning beetles. Uh, they, they come in different colors. They're, a lot of them are kind of bluish. They have a, a bluish sort of bloom to them. Look pretty cool. And so, yeah, that, that's one that I would uh, think about, at least. I have uh, used to catch tiger beetles when I was a kid, and tiger beetles are amazing. I love them. But uh, I've never actually kept them as a pet, but they're amazing predators. Um, I've also been interested in the luminescent click beetles. I've thought about purchasing some of those because they actually glow in captivity unlike you know a lot of creatures like the there are some roaches that produce you know they glow in the wild and in captivity they don't so things like that uh, those are some some options to think about at least so leopard gecko 5 do you breed leopard geckos uh, the leopard gecko is not a gecko I have bred I may do that in the future but um, I have confined my breeding of geckos to morning geckos and accidentally crested geckos, and I guess breeding is not exactly the word in either case, because all of those were produced by parthenogenesis. SD Explorer says, hello, I'm a new subscriber. Any tips on moving your fish tank? I'm moving about an 18-hour drive away. Ooh. SD says, good question. Um, ooh, yeah. Um, and, okay, I will answer that. Um, let's see. What size is your tank, SD Explorer? 10-gallon tank? Okay. Uh, you can move a 10-gallon tank fairly easily. The largest tank that I've ever moved, let's see, got to think about that. That I've ever moved from one house to another is a 55. And I've moved 37 gallons and 20 gallons, high and low, high, high and long. I've moved 10 gallons in smaller tanks. It's very, very possible. The main thing you have to think about, well, a couple things to keep in mind. You want to preserve some of that water, and if you're doing, you said, an 18-hour drive away, that is a little tricky. But what I would do is use breather bags myself in that situation. It kind of depends on how many fish you have. If you have a few fish, breather bags is a good idea. If you have a ton of fish, you might want to do the bucket method instead. But um, if you have a relatively few fish, you probably want to bag the fish individually into breather bags and then put them in a cooler like a styrofoam cooler or a plastic cooler, so they're protected from temperature extremes. You, of course, wouldn't put ice in it, but um, something like uh, that kind of cooler, you may or may not need a heat pack, depending on the temperature of this season. In most places, you probably wouldn't. Um, and the breather bags have to be separated enough so they're not pushed against each other, because if they are, you know, the membranes of the bags are pushed against each other, that can interfere with the respiration of the bag. And you would drain most of the water from the tank and depending on your decor and plants and things like that, I mean, um, there are different directives based on what you've got going on there as far as plants and decor and things like that. But if you just have a very basic tank with not a lot of live plants or anything like that, you drain the water down until, until it's quite low, but the gravel's still moist, so on. And you could even put the filter medium in a bag so that it stays moist, but it can breathe a little bit. And then uh, with only that very small amount of water in the tank, you can put it in a place in your car or truck or whatever you're using where it's not going to be jostled around. It's not going to be subjected to pressures or, or um, getting, you know, moving from side to side. You want to pack it well. And then once you get there, the thing is you'll, try to, you'll need to try to fill up the tank with water of a temperature that is not going to shock the bacteria and also make sure the water is dechlorinated as it's going in. So try to get it as close to the water temperature that your aquarium usually is as you're putting it in and that it's also dechlorinated as you get it in there. And then once you've done that, you can turn on the filter and everything, get that going and put, you need to get the fish in there. They are in breather bags. So drip method would be good or um, some, depending on if you can get the temperature close enough, 
you might even consider doing the, the dump method, um, basically, which means little to no acclimation because a breather bag, you don't really want to float it in the tank because you can, at least not for very long, because that can cause the fish to not have any oxygen if it, the bag floats in the water like that. Um, as long as the temperature is okay, you, you will have to be careful about ammonia spikes, but if you've been careful to keep you know enough water and ex temperature extremes, you've avoided temperature extremes, you'll be able to keep the gravel um, there'll be some bacteria in the gravel and in the filter medium as long as you've kept it from temperature extremes and kept it from drying out and you might have a little bit of an ammonia spike but you won't have to recycle the whole tank um, hopefully and if there are plants and different things in there that can mitigate the effects but also the way you treat the plants is going to be different from just treating an essentially a basic tank without plants but hopefully that gives you um, some some guidance on how to do it I've moved many aquariums successfully uh, using basically that method all right, so let's go. Sorry, I'm, I'm going back and back and back uh, to find out where I was. Okay, so I hope I don't miss anything. So Salmon or Desolate World says, favorite candy of yours? Ooh, well, unfortunately, I don't get to eat a lot of candy because I'm very sensitive to refined sugar and my blood sugar spikes and crashes. I don't get to do it very often, but um, if I had to pick, I would say... I like, I like chocolate, and there are some types of chocolate made without refined sugar that I can eat, so I, I do indulge in that from time to time. And I really, if I'm just saying I don't care what I'm eating, all the rules are off and I can eat whatever I want. I do like malted milk. I like jelly beans, especially like the jelly bellies and that kind of thing. So those are a couple that I really like. Mr. Spudbud, welcome, and Persni Persnickety Cyrus, how are all the isopods doing? I saw your videos on them a bit ago and grew an interest. I don't have any. I'm a plant guy, but I love them so much. Doing really well. I'm getting a lot of reproduction. Um, I had a problem with my clown isopods a while ago where I inadvertently allowed the substrate to dry out a little bit too much, and I lost some babies. The adults were still okay, but I lost some babies, and now I'm getting babies uh, again. Um, pretty much all the rest of them are doing really, really well. Um, I wish I had four times the space to dedicate to them and four times as many species as I have, but um, I am having a lot of fun with them, and they have been producing really pretty well for me. So yeah, they're doing really well, and I'm enjoying them a lot, and I highly recommend them. Even if you're a plant guy, maybe you should get into keeping a couple of isopod species. Uh, let's see. And Trey Beasley, welcome. Animals Are Life says, how do you keep your giant Kenyan isopods dry or moist? I would say very much in the middle. I'm, you can keep them both ways. They do pretty well both ways. But I would say the substrate is right in the middle. It's not, not extremely moist. And, you know, you never want it soaked for any isopod. You never want it just sopping. That's bad news. But, um, you know, on, on the moisture side, like Oniscus ocellus, I keep those pretty moist. On the drier side, Armadillidium or um, Spanish Porcelios, like my giant titans. Um, those are on the drier end. And these are somewhere in the middle, the, the Spanish isopods, probably slightly on the dry side. But they are so adaptable. Okay, let's see. Hmm. Leopard Gecko 05, what is your favorite substrate for dart frogs? Uh, I like ABG mix or similar mixes. Um, I use any herp substrate, is what I've got in there with my dart frogs right now, which is um, very similar to the ABG mix, and that that is what I really like with a nice thick layer of, I tend to like magnolia leaves on top, or live oak leaves, something like that, that's going to break down fairly slowly um, on top of that. And then the lowest layer, the drainage layer, I use the um, feather light or lightweight drainage layer that uh, any herp sells, you can get at other places too. It's made of sintered glass, recycled glass. A good product. I, I like it better than the hydro balls. I just like the look of it better. It, I don't think it works any better or any worse. They, they function the same way, but um, that's what I use for my uh, drainage layer typically. And then I just have uh, like a nylon window screen in between them. So bottom layer is the feather light, then a window screen, and then the ABG mix or the any herp um, substrate for vivariums, and then uh, the layer of leaf litter, which I, and I like magnolia or live oak for that. All right, let's see. Um, I'm just scrolling back to make sure I don't miss anything. 
Very cool. Have you tried it out of a vivarium in a 10 gallon fish tank with a custom panel to make it as a vivarium? Like when you stand it up on its side so it's a vertical, uh, vertical build? I had a tank like that that I got second hand. I ended up cleaning it up and selling it because um, I didn't, uh, didn't want to use that. I can't remember why I didn't want to use that particular one. Oh, it wasn't going to fit where I wanted to put it. I didn't have a, a space where it would fit, so I didn't um, end up keeping it. But uh, I haven't done that, but I've been interested in doing that. You can do the, the vertical um, conversion kits with a lot of you know, various... You can do 20-gallon high, 20-gallon long, 10 gallons, and I think that would be cool to try. So... Uh, let's see, where am I now? Oh, someone more. Don't feel bad. That, that's totally fine. You don't have to feel bad at all about that. Ben's Aquariums, welcome. Elaine Smith says, really sorry, Russ. I'm going to be missing this. My friend of 17 years has just passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, that, that's a very good reason to miss it, and I'm, I'm really sorry about that. You have my condolences. I'm sorry for your loss. That is very sad. And uh, Scott Richardson says, thank you for your videos. You're very welcome. And I'm glad it helped. Animals are life. Um, let's see. Okay, where are we? Leopard Gecko 05. Can you take dead or alive leaves from the wild and put them in your dart frog's cage or do you buy the leaves? You can take dead leaves. I would not recommend collecting live ones. But if you have magnolia trees or oak trees, those are two good ones. And it really doesn't matter what kind of oak or um, magnolia, as far as I can tell. People use various types. Those are two good ones, depending on where you live, too. I mean, if you live in the tropics, I used to live in Hawaii, and you could get sea grape leaves really easily. Um, there are various types you can do and collect them. I do recommend sanitizing them first. And my method of sanitization is to put them in a glass baking dish in the oven about 200 degrees for about half an hour. And that seems to pretty much uh, take care of any pests that might otherwise end up in your tank. And believe me, there are a lot of pests that you don't want in your tank that could end up there if you don't use some sort of, of sanitization procedure. So you can do it. Um, excuse me. You can do that, but it's not... Um, I, I would not recommend skipping that step if you're going to do it. Ben's Aquariums, hi. Welcome. Yeti Grant, I'm making fruit flies while watching your video. Cool. Uh, Mr. Snake says, I was trying to join earlier, but my mom won't give me back my phone. <laughs> well, I'm glad she has now. Ranid Guy says, what is the most exotic fish you've ever kept? Ooh, that's an interesting uh, question. Let's see. Wow, i got to think about that. Let's see. I've kept a lot of species over the years, and... Hmm. Wow. Oh, boy. I don't know. Hmm. I'll have to think about that one. Um, I don't know. I don't think I've kept any really like super rare fish or anything like that. But I have kept a lot of different types. Hmm. I did get Celestial Pearl Danios when they were early in the hobby, so they were kind of exotic at the time. They're pretty tame now. I mean, you can get them really easily, but I got them when they were mostly wild caught um, and bred bred some, but the, the adults were, would only eat live food, basically, and I got the, the next, um, I got the babies, you know, eating other foods, but um, that, I guess you could call that uh, exotic, but I'm sure there are other species that could be considered more exotic. I mean, that's, that's just what I'm uh, thinking about right now. I've kept various types of cichlids, kept some fairly, fairly fancy cichlids, I guess, um, but, I mean, I don't know. Uh, some African cichlids, like the Red Face Max was kind of something when I was in the store buying that one at the time at least. He said, you know, this one, not everybody has this, and I got that. That was fun. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Aquahog says, how many times a week can you feed peas to fancy goldfish? Well, you probably could do it every day as long as you didn't feed them too many. Just like one along with the rest of their food, you could. Um, that might make their feces a little loose, but you could do that. Um, I would say two or three times a week would be fine, and just give them one or two uh, at a time, and that would be perfectly fine. Um, let's see. Okay. How many weeks? No, let's see. Alice Cape 123 says, do isopod cultures smell? 
Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by smell. As long as they're properly maintained, they smell like the forest floor. That's what I would say. Um, they don't really have a smell beyond that. They smell a lot like the clean earth you'll find at the bottom of a, you know, the floor of a forest with the leaf litter. That's what it smells like. Other than that, they don't really have a smell. But if, if that doesn't smell objectionable to you, I mean, it's not like you can smell it from across the room either. You have to get pretty close to it before you can smell it. So I would say they don't really have much of a smell. Um, Roger's Aquarium, hi and welcome. Someone Noir says, now I have another question in the name of fan art. Favorite color? Please don't say you're colorblind. Well, blue is my favorite color, especially sky blue. I'm partially colorblind, but I can still see colors. I just see them differently than most people. Um, but I love blue, and I can see blue very easily. So um, you're good there. I can definitely see blue. All right, uh, and, I, and it is my favorite. Leopard Gecko 5, what is your favorite type of dart frogs to keep? Well, I say... I've only had two species of dart frogs. Um, I've only had um, the one I have now, bumblebee dart frogs, and I had an Aratus dart frog that was given to me along with my trio of bumblebee dart frogs. And unfortunately, when I was moving the vivarium, or shortly after I moved the vivarium, the lid wasn't settled on perfectly, and it hopped out, and I found it too late. It had hopped out and, and desiccated. Um, so I've only kept those two species. Uh, I want to branch out a bit eventually. I would love to get some of the Azureus, they're the, the blue, vivid blue ones, because like I said, blue is my favorite color. So I would like to do that someday, and I would like to do some thumbnails. Um, there are a lot of different types um, that I would love to do. So let's see. Mr. Snake says, I have a pet leech. It's not exotic, but it's a bizarre pet. Well, bizarre, and, and I would say kind of exotic. That's that's pretty unusual anyway, and that's part of the definition of exotic, right? I would say so. All right, Xander, uh, would you help me out and put Puggo back? I think she's she's ready for it. I don't want her to get too cold out here. So, thank you. I appreciate that. There you go. Yeah, oh, I'm still live streaming. I, I guess I've got to finish soon, but let's see. Um, Rented guy says, Celestial Pearl Dandies, that is, an, that is awesome. They are still a fish that's in high demand and very beautiful. Yeah, I really enjoyed those a lot. And spawning them was really easy. Raising them was pretty easy. They, they, were, uh, they grew really fast. The main problem that I ended up having with them is um, they were really susceptible to some sort of infection. I'm not entirely sure what it was, but they'd get like a saddle-like shape on their back. And then they would uh, die. And I ended up losing them to that, which was really bizarre after I had spawned them and produced a nice little school of them. That, that's what happened. But this was, this was quite a few years ago. I might have to try them again. I really liked them. I love the fact that they didn't really want to be kept too warm, so you didn't need a heater in room temperatures. Low 70s or even high 60s was okay for them. really liked that. You're welcome, Aqua Hogs. And Yeti Grant says, Phylobates Terribiles Mint are the best dart. Oh, I, those are cool looking. I like those. So Manor says, I think leeches are cute, to be honest. <laughs> My wife doesn't agree, but uh, that's okay. She never has specifically prohibited me from keeping one, but I don't know. She might, she might if I tried. I don't know. They are very interesting to watch, though. I used to get attacked by them down by the lake that I lived in as a kid. I would get them all over me. Um, and then, yeah, they were, that was unpleasant. Um, Leopard Gecko 05, can you see the color yellow and black? Yes, I can. Basically, I have a red-green color blindness and a mild blue-yellow color blindness, and the red-green is the one that causes the most confusion. Blue-yellow, I don't actually get confused, so it's kind of a misleading term for it, but um, it does make for some interesting times. Once in a while, I'll see a road sign or something like that that looks blank, and I'll say, why is there a blank sign there? And people say, it's not blank, it says da 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 because the two colors happen to blend together for me, and then maybe if I get really close, sometimes I can see it. That's it's about the worst uh, thing that happens, I guess, because of it. Robert Gear says, what's your favorite Leomorph? Hmm. Well, that is a great question. Um, I, I like the, um, the tangerines a lot. I've never had one. But I remember seeing some at a, lep a reptile expo and just saying, wow, those are something. Um, I, I do like the wild types a lot. I mean, ours is essentially a wild type. Um, she might have a little more yellow in her than, than normal, I'm not sure, but um, 
I, I like the wild types a lot, um, but I think, yeah, if I were to go for a really fancy morph, I think it'd be a tangerine. They just, they blew me away when I saw those. There's a lot of neat stuff out there though these days. Okay. Um, oh, Renegade guy's saying that's Colin Norris. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I should, uh, I'm going to have to watch for that next time. Hopefully they developed a little bit of immunity over the generation since I was keeping them. Because this was what, I don't know, eight years ago maybe? Something like that? I don't, I don't know exactly. Six years ago? Aqua Hogs. Okay, one more question. Angels or discus? Well, I've kept angels. I really like angels. and never kept discus. I'm sure I would like them if I had kept them. But if I were to say, if someone were to say, here, here's a 120-gallon tank. Uh, and you have everything you need to set it up, and which one do you want, angels or discus? I think I would go with angels, honestly. Not because I have anything against di discus, I really like them a lot, but I just like the fact that angels are a lot less, uh, tend to be a lot less skittish, and, uh, you know, you can have some problems with really picky eaters among discus and so on. Angels are little pigs. It's amazing they stay so thin in profile because they're little pigs and they'll beg for food when they see you, and I love that. It's just fun because you can see how excited they get when you uh, when you come near the tank. Okay, Mr. Spudbud, I've had these small leeches that came in as hitchhikers on an aquatic plant order. I think they were called tadpole leeches or something. They ate pond snails and bloodworms. Really interesting. See, that would be cool if uh, one that you didn't have to worry about uh, feeding blood or anything. That that would be pretty neat. I could see that. So Manoir's desolate world, jeans, shorts, or capris? I usually wear jeans, and my wife says that I look best in jeans. She likes, she likes it when I'm wearing a t-shirt and jeans. That's like her favorite outfit for me, so I'll say jeans. Mr. Snake said, my ribbon snake is, seemed to be recovering ever so slightly from snake fungus. Good! Good! And is he still eating and everything? Doing all that? That's always a good sign. Oh, I'm... I'm Backed up, everybody's trying to catch up here. Vexing Cat, welcome, says um, snail leeches. I have a tank that I'm trying to get them out of. Hmm. I wonder if assassin snails would eat the leeches. Has anybody ever tried that? Have you ever tried assassin snails with leeches? Roger's Aquarium. Have you ever kept a pom-pom crab or other freshwater crabs? Just thinking here for a second. I haven't. Um, I've contemplated keeping like the Thai, tiny little Thai spider crabs uh, and I really really want to do someday some vampire crabs the um, semi-aquatic or semi-terrestrial almost terrestrial crabs from uh, Sulawesi that would be really cool but I haven't haven't done that yet um, pom pom crabs yeah pom pom crabs are saltwater to my knowledge the ones that carry the anemone on on their claws but yeah, it could be a different common name um, for uh, like the Thai spider crab or something. Um, so, Roger's Aquarium saying, I see being sold under that name is fresh. Okay, it may be the same crab than the, the Thai spider crab that I'm thinking of. Renegade guy says, angelfish are also less maintenance. Captured by discus can do well in a variety of water conditions, but the trick is keeping things very consistent, which requires frequent large water changes. Right, angelfish are definitely more forgiving that way. Um, although they appreciate water changes, they, they probably just, they tend to be hardier in lots of ways and just less high maintenance. So that's, that's probably why I would do that. Because honestly, um, although I am up for a challenge once in a while with creatures, um, I enjoy the challenge of, you know, breeding a specific species or whatever. It's nice to have a lot of them that are just fascinating and also easy. I'm not one who says, oh, this is rare and challenging, so I like it, and this one is easy and common so I don't it's um, you know some people are kind of they think about it as sort of a fashion show of the pe creatures they keep and for me it's a big consideration is how easy is it how low maintenance is it I'm, I'm much more likely to, to do that um, let's see I'm going back here Leopard Gecko 05, do you breed dart frogs? Not yet, but I may well do that in the future. We've been contemplating it. Okay. So, Solmanor, you're going to send send along with the other one. Great. I, um, I'm i really excited about it. Solmanor made me some fan art that I want to show everybody. It's going to be coming up in a video soon. Um, so, keep your eyes open for that. Um, let's see. I think I answered that one already. Um...
Okay. I started a paludarium. Heckoff says, I started a paludarium and soon I'm going to put either white cloud minnows or guppies. Hmm, either one could be a good, um, good uh, option for a paludarium, depending on, you know, they're both pretty uh, similar in, in terms of size requirements, so those could be good. Good choices, I think. And leopard gecko, five of your favorite morph of leopard geckos. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, tangerines, I would say, so far at least. And Varanid guy, animals are life, yes, the more well-known species of pom-poms are salt. And that's what I'm thinking of, the ones that carries the anemones and uses them to ward off predators and that stuff. And can you keep a sea anemone as a pet? Well, yeah, yeah, you can. A lot of people keep the bubble tip anemones. They are difficult. You have to provide immense amount of really high quality light, and you have to provide good wallet quality. But yeah, I've also accidentally inadvertently, unwillingly, bred uh, Aptasia anemones. A lot of uh, saltwater, you know, marine aquarists do that. The Aptasia anemones live in um, aquariums as a pest. So I used to have a lot of them. Uh, I got a uh, peppermint shrimp that took care of most of them. So, uh, but yeah, the, there are a lot of anemones that are hard to take care of, and then there's some that are too easy to take care of in the marine hobby. Um, DJ's mix. Have you bred any albinos? Uh, albino, albino what? I have bred some albino things, yes, but I'm just wondering what species you're talking about. And okay, Mr. Snake says it's eating. Good. That's always a good sign if it's still eating. Hopefully it'll continue to heal. Leopard Gecko 5 says what state do you live in? I live in the state of Utah and got to go herping. There's some great places to herp here. So when my video about herping comes out, check that out. You'll, you'll be amazed at what I saw. At least I hope you will. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, Robert Year, thanks again for the stream. Oh, thank you, and see you later. Bye. And Brandon Guy, let's get more likes on this video for this gentleman. Ha! Ah, I like it. Let's do it. That would be great. Then uh, my channel gets more popular and I can do more live streams. Ah, thank you. I see some happening now. By the way, I'm really close to 9,000 subscribers, so thank thank you to all of you who have subscribed and continue to support my channel. It's really exciting. I will probably hit 9,000 in the next couple of days. So maybe even before Friday, before my next video comes out. Um, let's see. Um, all right. Yeah, I see some like action up there. Thank you, everybody. Um, and someone else says, yes, I'm going to have to do a lot of research because I'm definitely thinking of sea anemones now. Favorite underwater creature aside from whales, which I can't keep. Right. But anemones are definitely more doable than whales. Although, unless you're going for a simple, easy species like Aptasia anemones, which uh, you could just probably get by setting up a small marine aquarium, you know, cycling it and doing everything appropriately, and by the fact of adding live rock, you would probably end up with anemones, and as long as you fed the tank, you'd, you'd have anemones growing, and you wouldn't have to worry about it. You could easily do that. I don't know if that's the species you really want, but you could do it. Jack Bordeaux says, what type of ecosystem do you think would be the best to set up? Hmm. Well, there's lots you could set up. I think uh, an easier, one of the easier ones to set up if you're talking terrestrial is a um, tropical vivarium like the type dart frogs live in. That's a good one. Um, you could also do a more arid one like the leopard geckos live in. That Those are two good ones for terrestrial setups. Um, a pretty simple ecosystem to set up if you want to do an aquatic one is one for opaiula, the Hawaiian shrimp. Super easy. Uh, it takes a while. To set it up uh, time-wise, you have to let it cycle properly, and that takes several weeks. Once you have, it is extremely low maintenance, probably the easiest ecosystem I've ever had to keep. Because honestly, though I am an advocate of water changes for most aquatic systems, you don't need to do water changes in no Paiula system. I have one set up now that has not had a water change in three years, more than three years. It's doing, doing great. Shrimp are still breeding. Everything's great. So that is one. Um, Let's see. Leopard gecko 5. How many leopard geckos do you have? Currently just one. I have owned four in my lifetime, I believe. But I, currently I just have one. Um, Unbox Warehouse. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome. Vexing Cat. Does Utah have rosy boa? Uh, we don't, but we do have um, rubber boas that are natives to the state. The only native boa species is the rubber boa. I have only seen one in the wild. Rescued it from some kids who had found it up in the, the mountains and uh, gently removed it from their custody because they weren't 
going to be very nice to it. And so I removed it and released it into the wild again. But uh, yeah, that's the only, only one we've got here. DJ's Mix says, to my previous question, either leopard geckos or trilobite beetles. Um, specifically because I've never seen an albino trilo. Oh, okay. I have not bred albinos of either of those, no. Although I've had, i produced some albinos of other things. Uh, let's see. I produced an albino zebra finch. I produced albino, um, some albino isopods, of course. I've done I have albino convict cichlids and, and some other, some other creatures, too. Um, so Manoir says, what does the digital clock say to his mother? Clock on the wall. Hmm. I guess we'll find out the answer to that soon. Mr. Snake, have you, have any of you seen marine isopods? I have kept and bred marine isopods. When you set up a marine aquarium with live rock, typically there are marine isopods hitchhiking on it, small ones. They don't get very big, but, uh, yeah, most marine aquaria that have live rock and that kind of system have marine isopods. So I have had them and kept them, and they breed like crazy in a setup like that, along with the amphipods that are uh, that come along with the live rock and several other creatures, like the tiny little fanworms and things like that. Um, and leopard gecko five. I have three dart frogs right now, and vexing cat parts of Oregon. We have rosy boa. Those are cool. I, there were some in the zoo, the educational collection in the zoo that I used to work at, and I got to interact with those a bit. They, they're beautiful snakes. And Mr. Snake said, giant marine isopods. Those I have not. And someone else says, look, Mom, no hands. <laughs> I like that. It's a good one. Leopard Gecko 05 says, do you like eco-earth for a substrate for leopard geckos or dart frogs? Um, I would, I, I've heard of some people using eco-earth for leopard geckos with success. I have never tried it, uh, so I can't really comment on that. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it as a bioactive uh, substrate because I think it packs too much, can get too acidic, um, or too, you know, uh, either too dry or too acidic. It's hard to keep a balance if you're going to do it as a bioactive substrate. You can use it as just a substrate, though. Um, and then. For dart frogs, I would not recommend it because they really need a planted setup and you can't do a long-term healthy planted setup like the kind dart frogs need without a more aerobic substrate. So I, I shouldn't say can't. Maybe there's somebody who can do it, but it's, it's a lot harder. Um, so I would not recommend it for dart frogs. Mr. Snake says, eco earth compresses a lot. It does. Leopard Gecko 5, which zoo did you work at? Well, I volunteered at the Honolulu Zoo quite a long time ago, like, what was that, 11, 12 years ago, something like that. And then uh, a few years after that, I worked at the Hogel Zoo, which is local to me. It's, it's about uh, half an hour, 45 minute drive from where I live now. I used to live closer. Um, well, at the time, yeah, I lived about equidistant, but on the other side, I guess. Mr. Snake said, I have tried it for my green anoles. And um, it says it compresses, doesn't drain well, even with a drainage layer. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Um, it only really works as a, well, I would say in general, I use EcoEarth as a substrate, but when I do, it's not an attempt to be a bioactive um, vivarium unless it's, it can be the single layer type with just the um, EcoEarth and then the leaves, but it doesn't work as well as a full multi-layer bioactive substrate tends to because of those reasons. It compresses, it can get too wet on the bottom layers and kind of go anaerobic and get acidic and uh, it can be a mess. So not that you can't use it in certain applications, but they're limited and the longevity of that system is such that you're going to have to replace the eco earth periodically and be very careful about the moisture balance. And Mr. Stake says, I only use eco earth now from adding it to make a mixture. And I, yeah, that's, that's what I tend to do as well. Wow. Um, We've gotten some good like action. We've gotten, had a lot of great questions, everyone. I'm just looking at the clock here and seeing, oh, I was supposed to do half an hour and I'm doing almost 50 minutes, which I'm not complaining about. That's great that we had enough questions to keep it rolling. And I'm really excited that you were here to participate. Um, thanks for those of you who hit the like button. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to answer a couple more questions and then I got to go. But keep your eyes peeled for the next video that's coming up. I'm not sure which one I'm releasing yet. Uh, but the, the herping trip video is coming up pretty soon, so keep your eyes open for that. And I've got some other ones too. Persnickety Cyrus, this is my last question. 
Do you have any future plans or videos for the isopods? Even if it's just an update in a few weeks or months, I'd love to see more. And yes, I will definitely do that. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it, and have a great night.